So, well, thank you everyone for coming to the second lecture of Ali Yazdani. He gave a wonderful lecture yesterday about something really elusive to find, right? The Majorana fermions. Uh, today, the, the, the continuation of his lectures will be on twisted bilayer graphene. So just remembering you, it's a 75 minutes long. Don't reframe yourself to ask any questions. Put as many questions as you want in the chat box. We'll have plenty of time to discuss, and we can also talk to Ali during his talk. So Ali, thank you again for this second lecture, and please take over the session. Okay, thanks very much, Ricardo. Thanks uh, for having me. Uh, and uh, as you said, I'm going to talk about a completely different topic than last time. I'm going to talk about more super lattices which I think you've heard a lot about in this school, uh, I think from Pablo and maybe from Alan McDonald. So since you have had that background, um, it helps me a lot to go quickly through the introductory part of uh, this uh, rapidly moving field um, and try to get to some uh, experiments uh, that are actually very, very new. So let me just very quickly remind you uh, uh, the way we are thinking about creating this new electronic system is by taking 2D materials and stacking them on top of one another and twisting them relative to one another. And this uh, twisting, uh, I, it creates basically an interference between the two atomic lattices, which gives you a, what we call the Moray pattern. And uh, this is an additional electronic, uh, this is an additional uh, potential for electrons to move through uh, as we uh, think about the electronic structure of this combined uh, system. And um, now what your eyes are picking out, and this is something that you, it will come up in my talk uh, many times, is uh, you think about the A and B sub lattice of graphene. Uh, you know, they're not equivalent, as you know. And uh, the, what your eyes are picking up in the middle of this Moray pattern are, uh, you know, what we call AA stacking. This is at very small angles. Uh, basically, the A sub lattice is stacked on top of the A sub lattice. And this, of course, transitions as you move away uh, periodically, going from the A sub lattice being on the B sub lattice. Of course, this is a, a gradual transition. This is what your eyes are, are picking up from these uh, uh, patterns. So electronically, let me just quickly remind you, we, uh, we have graphene. Graphene has this direct band structure. Uh, and of course, if you rotate in real space, you're also rotating in momentum space. And now uh, you have two Dirac cones that are at a slightly different uh, position in case space relative one to one another. And you can think of these Dirac cones at first uh, basically as independent. But of course, now that you have tunneling between the layers, you have the hybridization of the two electronic states. Uh, and that hybridization modifies the band structure of this system relative to graphene. In particular, what happens is that if you think about this Dirac cone and where they touch at some momentum in between the Dirac points, uh, this touching point basically starts to get gapped out, if you wish, or pushed out around because of the hybridization. And as you uh, decrease the twist angle, uh, this is actually the condition under which uh, you get this point kind of getting flatter and flatter. And this is what gives rise to a flat band condition, uh, as we call the uh, uh, the magic angle. And this was uh, discovered basically by Suarez Morel and then Bitzerer and McDonald in electronic structure calculations. So this is about one degree, which is what uh, the angle is supposed to be for twisted bilayer uh, graphene. And this is electronic calculation from McDonald's, which as you have seen in the school, it gives you these very flat electronic states. And uh, uh, let me just remind you uh, that uh, this flatness uh, is you, you have degrees of freedom having to do with the two, uh, two graphene sheets. So you have the two valleys, K and K prime, because of A being equivalent of the, of the lattice structure. And now you, you translate all of that into this uh, twisted bilayer graphene. So you have what we call two mini Brillouin zones. In these two mini Brillouin zones uh, around what we call the original K and K prime of the original uh, graphene lattice is where you end up uh, with these flat bands uh, at, the, at the right angle. Now, uh, one of the things that, would, uh, that gives rise to a lot of very interesting physics in this uh, material is the degrees of freedom having to do with the degeneracy of these flat bands. Now, I should also mention that uh, uh, you can think about these electronic structure calculations 
uh, without any relaxation, which is what was done uh, very early on by Allen and other people. But of course, you have to take into account that the lattice structure is also relaxing. And what happens as a function of this relaxation is these flat bands sort of separate out uh, from what we call these remote bands, these bands that are uh, at higher energies uh, at relative to zero here being charge neutrality. So let's, we focus on these flat bands and you know, we have two spin and you have uh, two valleys degrees of freedom from graphene. So we can think about filling uh, these flat bands with uh, up to basically two, there are two, two bands, so we can fill up to eight electrons. So the, the notion I will use in this talk is uh, I use the filling factor nu as being zero at the charge neutrality. Uh, with, you have effectively four electrons in the system, so you can go down to minus four, or you can go up to plus four uh, as you gate this electronic system with a nearby gate. So uh, these flat bands, of course, were proposed, but as you uh, heard in these talks uh, by Pablo, he, his group uh, were the first to uh, basically create the structure with sufficient uh, precision of the angle uh, that could uh, then, in addition to angle being near the magic angle, the device being in a structure which can be gated, uh, they could basically move the chemical potential and explore how the electronic structure looks like as you fill in these flat bands. And as he told you, what they discovered is basically the presence of a correlated insulating state. So the band structure calculation by Allen and others give you these flat bands. But, and we know from, of course, uh, our experience with quantum Hall physics and many other areas of physics, these flat bands are, are, are you know, uh, very fertile ground for electronic interactions. Electrons try to avoid one another. And here the manifestation was that as you have filled that band, which is the nu equals two uh, in my notation or nu minus two, you deplete two electrons, you end up with an insulating state. Initially, this was touted as a mod state, but uh, whether it is a mod state or other broken symmetry state is, uh, remains uh, one of the questions that we are trying to address in the field. And of course, what was exciting in addition to that correlation in insulating phase is the fact that you can get superconductivity form as you dope away uh, from this insulating uh, ground state in the nearby filling. Now, the, uh, the resemblance of this uh, phase diagram, of, if you will, of the correlation uh, of, of a correlated insulator and a superconductor nearby, is looks a lot like things that we are familiar with, with uh, you know, strongly correlated superconductors, such as the cuprates, the heavy fermions, and iron uh, pinnictides. Uh, except, you know, usually you have to sort of flip this around to kind of almost make it look like uh, what was discovered in the system. So from these sort of diagrams, uh, you know, people have argued, and of course the observation of the insulating state, people have argued that this is a strongly correlated system. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, uh, this is kind of what I call impressionistic science. One thing looks like the other, so it must be the same. But uh, I think, uh, the ability to do experiments with spectroscopy actually really allows us to answer this question very precisely as I'll show you today. Now, let me just tell you about other development in this field besides the original discovery. Uh, this is data by Dmitry Efetov, uh, where he showed that in fact, if you make uh, di different devices as he claims are, are cleaner, uh, you can see a cascade of insulating states at every integer filling of, of this uh, flat band. So remember, if plus four is a full flat band, is where you have a, a, you know, a conventional insulator or minus four, and they have the charge neutrality, you can see these streaks of correlated insulator, and also many domes of superconducting behavior. As if that wasn't enough, uh, now there has been also, uh, ever since the beginning, from work of David Gobar Gordon and Andrea Young, uh, there is evidence of magnetism in this system. And we, along with the magnetism, there is also evidence of topological behavior. In particular, what was discovered uh, by Andre Young was when he takes a magic twisted bilayer angle samples, and, and I, as I'll show you in a moment, these are assembled on top of a boron nitride substrate. When he aligns the samples with the boron nitride underneath, he discovered that you see a quantus, quantum anomalous Hall effect at relatively high temperatures. So this system, uh, ha has topology in it as well. So there is a lot going on. There's correlation, topology, superconductivity, and you know, uh, there is a lot to figure out. 
So what, uh, what, what we like to do is bring in the power of scanning tunneling microscopy to study the system. And as I will show you, actually, even in the very initial studies of this work, uh, done previous to some of the theoretical work, SDM played a major role in order to not just image the moray lattice with the topography techniques, but also using spectroscopy and spectroscopic mapping uh, with the SDM to show that there are actually flat bands in the system. And I'll show you that. But what is exciting from the perspective of someone like me, who has been working in correlated systems for many years, is that this is a system that is tunable. For example, in high TC coup rates, what we did when we wanted to study behavior of the system as a function of uh, filling, of course, we had to make uh, samples with different uh, doping concentration. So the advent of gating of 2D structure, which is something, of course, super common for transport folks to think about, the ability to integrate that within our scanning tunneling microscope is very powerful because you, do, you can do density dependent spectroscopy of the system. And this, as I will show you, opens up ways to understand how the system is uh, correlated when it's strongly interacting and when it's not, as, as you will see. So what I'd like to do today, and feel free to interrupt me as I go along, is to show you how we visualize and do spectroscopy on these uh, devices and answer the question that I raised, which is how correlated are the electronic states in the system. And then I will show you uh, results from another experiment uh, which shows how the uh, presence of the degeneracies of the system, the spin and valley degrees of freedom, gives rise to a cascade of transitions as a function of filling, which may be related to the ground state insulating states. And this interplay of the cascades uh, of these degeneracies and the interaction cre creates these cascades in spectroscopy, as I'll show you. If there is time, uh, I will show you evidence uh, for actually a correlated churn insulator is a work that we just completed and uh, we ju it just posted online uh, two weeks ago, uh, which is uh, a, a quite an exciting development for us to be able to do, uh, to, to probe topological nature of these materials with the SDM. So let me tell you who's done all the work. Uh, the work in this area, my group got started by Yong Long, uh, who has now gone on to a, a postdoc at Harvard. And actually this work wouldn't have been possible without Jiamong Liu, who came to us from Philip Kim's group and bringing with it, hit him expertise on how to make a twisted bilayer or twisted other sort of graphene type structures. And uh, the other key players are all listed here, Berthold, Cheng Li, and the, the latest experiments, as you'll see, are done by Dylan, Kevin, and Mongshul. And we strongly collaborate with Andre Bernevik and my new colleague, uh, Biao Lang, in trying to understand these experiments. So maybe let me give you a little bit of a bit of history of the, what SDM had done in this field. This is work of Eva Andre uh, done in 2009, actually, uh, before all the excitement. Eva did this experiment uh, where they create, they found twisted uh, by layers of graphene on graphite. And um, now I told you about the flat bands uh, in, that Alan predicted. Uh, well, these flat bands were actually predicted after this experiment. And uh, what's in this experiment is basically these peaks in the density of state that appear in the moray uh, lattice structure that you see. And in fact, this is the first thing kind of you would expect from the theory uh, that the, the flat band electronic structure has its enhancement over the AA sites where there is strong tunneling uh, between the two uh, uh, graphene bilayers. And it's the observation of these uh, sharp peaks, which in this experiment, which didn't involve any gating, uh, is the early indication that this system actually gives rise to a flat band in the system. Subsequent experiment actually by Dylan, who works with me now as a postdoc, showed that as they vary the twist angle, this was done in Mike Cromie's group, uh, they showed that they could not only see Van Hoel singularities of flat bands, uh, but also they could tune these Van Hoel singularities. Well, okay, these are Van Hoel singularities. Not always they're very flat due to flat bands, as you'll see in this talk. But these Van Hoel singularities are a function of the angle, uh, which is tuning the Moray uh, lattice constant, uh, matched actually that of uh, Alan McDonald's uh, theory. So there is uh, quite a bit of very nice early work in SDM done before we even got involved in this field. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how we fabricate our samples because now we are not just looking at 
just twisted bilayer graphene like previous work, but we are doing experiments where we're creating gated structures uh, to do STM uh, as a function of gating. So you might have seen these uh, sort of tear and stack or related techniques uh, from Pablo where they tear up a, a piece of uh, a graphene uh, to create uh, a graphene uh, uh, with a, uh, uh, using a um, sort of a, a, a technique of uh, stamping, if you will. And this is actually how this process of creating the samples goes. You, you, you do it under a microscope, you create a polymer stamp for, with which you can pick up the, uh, the, the different layers and boron nitride is a key uh, substrate that we use in order to avoid charge fluctuations from the uh, substrate underneath. And then we tear off a piece of uh, uh, graphene from a monolayer graphene that's on the substrate, stack them at the right angle. And the complication for us is we have to turn this thing upside down in order to have it exposed uh, to, the, uh, to the SDM at the end of the day. And in addition to uh, that, we have to do all of this uh, while we keep the surface of the sample very clean. Because you remember there are polymers around and this is a quite a challenging thing. And we've had to work very hard to figure out all the little tricks uh, to create uh, clean samples. So here's what a clean sample looks like in the SDM studies. So if you look very carefully at this image, you see several different uh, types of periodicities. Of course, on the finest scale, if you look very carefully, you can see the graphene uh, uh, atomic lattice. And then you see another periodicity here, uh, which is actually due to the fact that the twisted bilayer graphene here are almost aligned with one another, but they're misaligned with the boron nitride uh, structure underneath it. Remember that also has a graphene-like structure, even though it, that's for sure the AB sub lattices are different atoms. And then of course you see the bright, dark, bright, dark, and this is the Moray pattern that corresponds to uh, this super periodicity that is created in the system. And if from just this image directly, uh, you can uh, figure out your twist angle uh, from the periodicity uh, that you see in the images. Now, let me first talk about the single particle properties of the system. And I'm uh, gonna start Ali, with- Ali, a naive question for me. From, from uh, in the previous slide, you showed that there are different stackings, right? You, you have uh, what you're calling orthorhomb stacking, the new ABBA site. Is this because it's multi-dimensional or is it directly consequence of the Moiré lattice? It's just directly consequence of the rotation. So, so you can it, get all these patterns just in a single- It's just dimension. a smooth transition from okay. AA stacking to AB uh, and the, the bridge site in between. This okay. repeats. And if you, if you, you know, you've seen this thing that Pablo does in his talks yeah. <laughs> where it makes you sick. If you do that, you really start <laughs> to see that, oh yeah, this is all just as a function of just the interference of these two patterns. That's the, that's the, those are the sort of the angles you get. Those are the stackings you get as a function of position. All right, thank you. And of course, this is very critical for the tunneling uh, between the two layers, which is creating the electronic structure. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about the gated structures. And these are gated structures, but first I wanna show you some data from very early experiments, which shows you, for example, in this device, at the gating that happens to be zero, you actually have, uh, you, when you take a spectra and you put your STM tip on this bright spot, which is where the AA sites are. So here we are not looking at the atomic lattice at all. We're just looking at the, uh, the Moray AA lattice where they have this enhanced density of state. And if indeed this enhanced density of state, as you know, Eva, Eva found, shows these uh, sharp peaks in the density of states, two very sharp and well separated peaks in the experiment. Now, uh, what's interesting about this is, so this is the signature of your flat band. What's interesting about this is that when you start looking at these samples with the STM, you discover that these samples often have strain and they often have a, a lattice constant in their Moray structure, which is, you know, if you think of this triangle, uh, it's not equivalent in different direction. And this is reflecting that strain. And this strain, of course, changes the electronic structure of the system, the single particle properties before we get to the many body physics. And it turns out that we can uh, use actually the STM images to extract information about strain in the system by making some assumptions like, you know, assume one layer is not strained and the other one which is rotated is strained. And then you ask yourself, what are the, what are the strain needs to be in the second layer to produce this image that you measured in the STM instrument. 
So that gives you information about strain, which you can feed into the theory, just like in the McDonald's uh, calculation of the flat band. There's another, there's another parameter in that calculation, and that has to do with the tunneling strength between the, uh, the two different uh, uh, graphene layers. And this tunneling strength, it's actually a, a ratio of the tunneling strengths that come into the calculation. It's the ratio between tunneling on the AA site and the AB site, that uh, those are the two parameters in the model. And this actually, you can also get an estimate from the STM measurement by simply the, the, the area of these AA sites, how much you have brightness here and how much you have darkness. And you can make that estimate and feed those two into the uh, sort of the con what we call the continuum model of, of the calculation of the band structure of this system. So I'm sure somebody mentioned that these are extremely difficult to calculate precisely. That's why you use these continuum model because the, the unit cell involves you know, 10,000 atoms in the realistic uh, a, a, a pattern of a sample. But these continuum models allow you to, to get a feeling for what the band structure should be and the flatness of the bands. So what you see here is some dispersion develops in these flat bands and the, 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 the distances to what I call the remote bands is also adjusted as you, as you change the parameter in the system. So what's nice about this is that we can take uh, such measurements uh, of both the topography and the spectroscopy onto the system. So notice these flat bands are filled, completely filled. So there is no many body physics here because they're completely occupied. And we can calculate what the density of state should be in the STM. And we get reasonably good agreement with the data. You can see these two peaks kind of match in terms of their sharpness to what you get from the the flat bands have now developed some dispersion because of strain. And you even can see some signature of the distance to the remote band, band host singularity here in the calculation with match the experimental results. So this, this makes us feel pretty good about understanding the single particle physics uh, of, these, uh, uh, of these structures. And we can also twist, and I'll show you later in the talk and look at different angles, but let's stick to the, to the magic angle, which is around one degree here and see now what happens as we take the system and dope it. So what's shown here is the same information that you had in the uh, previous sl uh, slide, which was basically the density of states, which had two peaks. And these two peaks now translate into these two bright lines, if you wish, of the two flat bands, what we call the upper and lower flat band uh, in the system that has the largest density of state. And what's happening here is that we gate the sample uh, to deplete these flat bands uh, from electrons and go towards the charge neutrality and then below it. Now you notice that in this device at zero, which is no gate voltage, these flat bands are below the chemical potential. As I'll show you later, this is, has to do with disorder in the sample, which provides some impurities, which gates basically dope our sample before we get started. We have gotten better at that and I'll show you that data uh, in a moment. But what I want to emphasize here, and this was done in this early work, well, early, like from last year, this field is moving fast, is uh, so I can take this data of spectroscopy as a function of gate and divide it into three different regions for you. you and I call this first the non-interacting regions. Non-interacting is when the flat bands are completely filled or completely empty. And you can see that in the STM spectra, they appear as very sharp peaks, relatively speaking, the ratio up and down between the region one up here and region three has to do a little bit, the, the height of these peaks has a little bit to do with the SDM setup condition is a technical detail that I won't get into. But what I wanna do is uh, uh, just talk about these sharp peaks and just say that they kind of behave as I showed you as what you would expect in a non-interacting regime. And if you follow this peak as it approached the chemical potential, you can even see here in this data that is getting sharper as you approach the chemical potential. And this is telling you that the lifetime of the quasi particles is getting longer. And as you would expect in a Fermi liquid like picture, uh, this sort of peak shows uh, some E squared sharpening approaching uh, the chemical potential. And so this is the whole band. So there is some information about the band all integrated here, but for the most part, the sharpening is something you can also understand with a weakly interacting picture. But what happens in region two, and remember region two is where all the exciting physics happens in this system, is when you're uh, starting to partially fill these flat bands. 
look at how the way to read this file, the read, read this diagram is you go down uh, uh, here in the plot and that's going down in gate voltage and then you go up here uh, with, to go to region two and then down again uh, in gate voltage and then uh, uh, sort of meandering again to this region two uh, plot, the second one in the lower band and then region three up here. You see the sharp peaks here are for the most possibly placed by very broad features except maybe when you're on this curve, which is exactly a charge neutrality in the system. So the first point here that I wanna make is when you get into the strongly interacting regime, or actually I should say, when you get into the regime where you have partial filling in the system, you see features that are very different from the non-interacting picture. So this was the first puzzle for us to solve. So in a, in a sense, the, the, the puzzle up here is manifest itself in this plot here. Here you have the upper flat band starting to cross the chemical potential. So you can understand that the upper flat band being partially occupied will have some interactions in it. But this peak here is associated with the lower flat band. But this lower flat band peak immediately becomes extremely broad in energy as soon as you occupy the upper one or partially occupy the upper one. And the same kind of physics happens up here. When you cross over the charge neutrality point, and start to partially unoccupy the lower flat band, the upper flat band, which is way above the chemical potential, uh, you know, 30, 40 millivolts above, it, it starts to get broad. We've never seen anything like this before. Of course, we couldn't do experiments like this before uh, because we couldn't, you know, take a system and take it from interacting and non-interacting regime with just applying a gate voltage and do spectroscopy at the same time. So we try to understand this behavior doing some of the things that's very common in this field, which is to apply to hartree fock calculation, uh, you know, to, to try to see what kind of, uh, ed, what we call electron addition removal spectra you would get, which is what we are measuring with the SDM. And you see here in this hartree fock calculation is that while you introduce interaction, the flat bands be, acquire some width, the shape of these things are not that gate dependent or, or density filling dependent as we see in the experiment. So, so the first thing I want to tell you is that this failure of the Hartree fog shows you how strongly interacting is this system. And how do we understand this failure of Hartree fog? Why does the mean field theory of sort of including interaction fails in capturing this SDM spectrum? So the, the way to understand this, let me uh, have you think about uh, it's a, a, a theme that will uh, occur a few times in this talk which is that if you go back and think of the SDM image in the, that I've shown you, these bright spots kind of look like the sites in which electrons like to accumulate. Actually, this, that's basically where you put all those eight electrons. And you can kind of think of this like a Hubbard-like picture in which you have interaction between the electrons when they are on this little, what I would call quantum dots on the AA sites. And of course, nearest neighbor interaction, and you have the different two flat bands. So I'm gonna represent the two flat bands by two discrete levels and just try to think about how would electron addition and removal spectra look like for such discrete levels as I tune the chemical potential, if you will. So of course, if I have uh, no electrons in them and I, uh, or, or they're completely filled, uh, all I would see is, uh, here they are completely empty, all I would see is those two levels are broadened by the hopping from the nearest neighbor AA sites. And of course, if I start to think about Coulomb interactions uh, between the electrons, I would say that, well, the Coulomb interaction, if I put an electron in there, uh, then uh, you know, you're basically going to try to uh, pay the Coulomb energy. So the energy of the next level is just shifted uh, by the Coulomb interaction mu. For the sake of uh, simplicity, I'm going to only take a single flavor at this site. So no spin, no valley, just a, just a spin less electron, just to illustrate the point. So you, what mean field theory will tell you is that if you had a partial filling, not one electron, but partial filling, this, uh, which is illustrated by, uh, by where the chemical potential is here, uh, but it is what you would expect is that uh, this level is shifted by the probability uh, of, the, of an electron being there. But of course, this is wrong. It's wrong because you know, electrons don't uh, cut in pieces. They're either there or not there. So in fact, what you have is a probability P, an electron being there, and one minus P, 
an electron not being there. And it is actually this, uh, these two possibilities that in the spectroscopy would take this single peak and turn into two peaks. So what I want you to think about is that basically uh, this broadening that we see is related to these, uh, what I call charge fluctuations. There are possibilities that there is a site where you try to put an electron there, there's an electron there with a probability p or y minus p that it's not there, and that affects your spectroscopy uh, when you have these things being uh, not average in a mean field way, and they are, you know, when the charge fluctuations are very strong. And I think basically you can try to model this in some simple way uh, using some sort of a Hubbard model. And here, of course, we want to be a little bit truthful to what is an approximate uh, one year function in the system. I don't know if you have theorists described that it's hard to construct one year function in the system because of their topological properties. But let's that leave that detail aside. You can kind of think about this sites, sites, two levels, on-site interaction U, nearest neighbor interaction uh, between uh, two levels, V0 V and V1. And uh, you can start to understand that this is actually a quite a complicated problem uh, to do. So you, you can do an exact diagonalization with, let's say, seven sites, which is what is uh, possible to do with computers today. And what you can do is compute the electron addition and removal spectra for these seven sites. And basically the argument I gave you, this charge fluctuation argument, comes out of this very simple, what I call baby calculation, although they're at the limit of what you can do in terms of uh, computation. So the two levels are sharp, but then when you start to partially occupy them, they develop additional features in this small calculation and if you now use your imagination that, well, we have many different flavors uh, in this problem, this, uh, these many different uh, peaks, you can think of it as the broadening that is going on in the data. So, oh, sorry. So the, the broadening here in the, in the calculation is what I think about are, are these features that we see in the experiment because we cannot, of course, model this uh, experiment uh, precisely because of the nature of the large degrees of freedom. So this was the first indication of very strong interaction in the system. And I wanna just acknowledge that this experiment was done at the same time uh, by two other groups uh, who uh, uh, basically the experimental results are very similar. So this is a group of Stefan Nachpergi at Caltech who uh, has this uh, very similar uh, experimental measurement as you can see in our case. And what Stefan saw was exactly the same thing these sharp peaks the detail somehow here varies from here to there. These are very early devices. I'll show you some more recent devices, which shows more features, as you'll see. But the first thing is this blurring that happens in the middle region where all, all the exciting physics of partially filled bands are. And this blurring physics, which is obvious here, as well as is here, and you can kind of see it here as well, uh, with, this sharp, with this broadening of this peak, is related to this breakdown of this non-interacting picture in the magic twisted bilayer graphene. Okay, so now this was early days, then we got better at making devices. Uh, what does better mean? Well, better means usually that we have more uh, cleaner devices, less disorder in the sample, and also an indication is whether the, the charge neutrality happens near zero gate voltage. And this is what we began to see when we start to make such magic angle graphene samples. So now by now you should be familiar with what I'm showing you. These two lines here are basically the two lines uh, that are the, the, the flat bands. And these are their end, they are full here above 40 volts in the gate voltage. The blurring that you see here is the blurring that I just talked about. And then down here they exit and they are, they're fully unoccupied. But now if you look at this data, in fact, if you had looked at the previous data very carefully, you would have seen that there are these sort of repeating features happening so every so often, every actually quarter filling of these bands as you uh, change the gate voltage. Now to bring that out, uh, because the STM current changes dramatically from line to line actually as you change the gate voltage, one thing you can do is you can take the DIDV and divide it by the the 
the current and the voltage that you've set in the STM junction. And what this does is it sort of takes into account that the height of the tip has changed dramatically because of the change in the density of states. And with that, you can sort of pick out a little bit easier with your eyes, uh, the same features that are visible in the raw data. So what it shows is that as you go through every uh, filling, an integer filling, so remember this is full eight electrons, four in the upper band and four in the lower band. We take one electron away uh, as we go from this voltage to this one. You see a feature here starting at zero volt, goes out to some finite, and then it just disappears. And then the problem resets itself as you go through the, uh, the integer filling three, and integer filling two, and integer filling one. And on the other side, a similar feature, less uh, sort of visible uh, because there is an electron hole asymmetry in this system, which, which is actually affecting this measurement. The question is, what are these cascade of features and what do they represent? Oh, here you can see it in the raw data. So in addition to this blurring that we see, we see some very well-defined uh, features in the spectra, uh, which is telling us something about what the electronic excitations are within each of these uh, integer filling uh, regions of, the, of these flat bands. So schematically, this is kind of how you can think of this data. And we, we set out to try to understand where do these features come from. So we went back to thinking about uh, our, if you like, quantum dot model of this system. You know, if, you're, if your STM image looks like this, this is sort of, you can't get it out of your head that the electrons are basically mostly living on these sort of puddles of, of uh, you know, uh, size of a moray site, okay? And they're hopping between them. And the hopping is so uh, weak, which is why you have your flat band. This is kind of a way to think about it. So of course, uh, we had before just two levels, no flavors, now, it, this experiment is basically starting to tell you that you need to put the spin and value degrees of freedom in the problem because you're starting to see within each flat band, which has four flavors, you start to see four features. So the full model is, of course, too complicated. This is even more complicated than high TC coupe rates. You have, you know, topping, uh, U, spin, valley, and too many degrees of freedom. So again, we try to make a simple model to try to understand the experiment. And in this limit of inspired by this image is to think about U being much, much bigger than T. So let's ignore the hopping altogether like we did before, except let's include the, the spin and value degrees of freedom. So you have, if you like, many sites that are independent, but very weak tunneling between them. Surprisingly, this simple model starts to show features that are reminiscent of the experimental data. So what is computed here is this sort of uh, Hubbard model uh, with the on-site interaction U. Again, you have uh, energy levels, two energy levels, and which each of them which in, which with their own density. And you can think about what the electron addition removal spectra looks like. So it turns out to understand what we see in the experiment we have to think about the successive uh, interplay between the interactions and the degeneracy of this system. So the fact that these look very similar inspires us to try to think about what is actually these features look like and what can you learn from this data about the property uh, of the system. So let me tell you what, what you're looking at. So let's start down here. So down here we have uh, uh, basically a, a energy level E and E minus E naught and plus E naught as representing the two flat bands. And you have almost no electrons in the system. Okay, and you can ask the question, uh, what are the addition, uh, electron addition and removal spectra uh, in, in the system? So V greater than zero is uh, arrows in, ways on which you can add electrons. V, uh, uh, v, v less than zero is arrows out. Uh, removing electrons. And we have to include the, the energy difference between the two levels and also U, the, uh, the, the, the Coulomb repulsion. So basically, we know that double occupancy is not there. The system, this is exponentially suppressed. You almost have no electrons in the system. You have very few sites uh, that have 
a, an electron in them because you have hardly doped the system. Let's set the chemical potential here to zero, okay? And uh, you can say, oh, these peaks basically uh, corresponds to adding electron with, uh, with zero energy, okay? Which is putting electrons here and adding electrons at, up here with two E naught, uh, which is the upper level. And you see two other very faint features down here because they, it's quite rare to have a singly occupied site. But the situation changes as you change your gate voltage to here. Now, what was rare, having no electrons in the system, you have almost every Moray site is occupied with one electron. So this is quite common. The chemical potential hasn't really changed in the system, but now you can kind of see that the two features that were very faint uh, representing a probability of uh, adding electron with energy, uh, let's see, with energy U, this excitation, is now becomes visible. And of course, you have also the possibility to add an electron to E plus U, that's also possible. So this is what you begin to see in this simple model calculation. Now, one more step in here is that if you cross one of these uh, uh, integer filling, what happens is that you basically now you have a situation where you have an integer number of electron in the system. It's very common to have an electron. And then when you have that situation, you of course have additional excitation uh, possible in terms of removal in, uh, in the system because you can remove that electron and get back that Coulomb potential U uh, in the system. <coughs> Excuse me. So I, um, what also happens is that in this simple model, the chemical potential of course jumps by the value of U when you have paid this energy to put that electron there. So what's nice about this is that of course, I can go through every one of these transitions that happens in the spectroscopy of this system when you take into account the interplay between the Coulomb and the, uh, uh, and the degeneracy of this system but you can sort of see how the arguments goes uh, forward. And what's really nice is that this, this matching of these things approximately uh, tells you that uh, the feature we see in the data that goes to some finite energy and then resets, which is what you see in a lot of these plots in, in the theory calculation is uh, even for example, this one that goes further out before it resets that charge neutrality gives you a way to extract the Coulomb interaction directly from this experiment. So you can see that the, the number that we get here is about 23 milli electron volt, which is what you read off of this chart, uh, in this experiment directly. So this is actually a measure of the strength of the interaction in the system. So why is this significant? Well, this is significant because um, this number is larger than bandwidth. So that's actually the key message of this talk, which is that U is the largest uh, energy in the problem. And this experiment proves that is larger than the bandwidth of the system because we can measure the bandwidth when the system is not interacting and we can measure you with making comparison uh, with this simple, calcu uh, simple calculation. Now, of course you would say, well, this looks very broad. The, the, the experiments, the theory look very sharp. So of course this has to do with the fact that the hopping uh, changes this problem. And we have made some effort in terms of uh, try to match this with the theory where you include some finite tunneling between the sites, including in an exact diagonalization calculation. And if you look at the results of this, uh, with, of, I admit mother's loving eye, in addition to those uh, broadening effects that I spoke about in the first part of the talk, you can start to see that these, uh, these sort of features that were sharp are now suddenly, they have developed more dispersion in terms of how they disperse in energy as you tune the gate. This is still needs improving as we go forward. But this model also tells us an additional piece of information about what the chemical potential is doing. And I think maybe Pablo talked about also in his talk about experiments done, as I'll show you in his collaboration with Weizmann, having to do with a very similar results as I'll show you in a moment. So, the chemical potential, as I mentioned, jumps by U uh, in this, in this uh, simple model. So we started asking ourselves, is there a way in which we can uh, measure the chemical potential in our experiment as we are changing the gate? So we realized that what, what we've been doing is focusing ex exclusively on the flat bands 
And the signal from the flat bands comes from the AA side. That's where it's the, that's where it's the largest. But you have asked, what happens if I go to the AB sites and do the same experiments that I've been telling you? Now, at the AB sites, the spectral density of the flat bands is lower. It shows some of the same physics that I've told you about when you look at the flat bands that appear at low energies. But the experiments here is much more sensitive to the remote band. In particular, you can see the edges of the remote band showing up here as you go between the blue and the red. This is kind of the gap that you crossing between the flat bands to get to the remote band. And you see in this experiment that there are these cascades of changes, just like there were cascades of changes near the chemical potential, there's a cascade of change of the edge of this remote band. So what you're looking at is this edge of the remote band density of state, which shows up in these experiments here. And this thing is moving up and down as you go through each of the quarter filling of the upper band and if you look very carefully, you can also see some features not as clearly in the valence remote band also on the other side. Or you can look carefully and you can see that there is a sort of a cascade of features the opposite direction when you're uh, looking at the conduction remote band when it is the, you're filling or emptying the lower remote band. So this is kind of reminiscence of this change in the chemical potential that I was telling you about. So how do we try to think about this? So when you try to add a particle into this remote band, remember it's unoccupied, let's say the conduction remote band. Of course, it is a single particle energy having to do with the energy of that gap edge. But then, of course, there's a chemical potential in the experiment. And if the chemical potential is adjusting itself uh, as you change the gate, it's reflected in this energy that you measure in the experiment. You could also argue that when you put an electron into this remote band, of course, it could interact with electrons that are in the flat band, which are near the chemical potential. So you may have to also include some sort of a Coulomb interaction between the, that electron and the electron that's there. This is the sort of the electron that you're tunneling. Let's just discount this for the moment, but we can also include it. If you discount it for the moment and just look at the energy of this flat band uh, as a function of gate voltage, you see this cusp-like behavior uh, of, the, of this energy, uh, which basically is telling you that have got the cusp-like behavior of the chemical potential. And the chemical potential is getting reset every time uh, you go through these, uh, uh, through these integer filling. Either it's above, is very, very visible. Below, is not as visible, but you can still see it if you look at the raw data. So what's happening in the system is that as it goes through each of these integer filling, it's resetting kind of its excitation spectrum because of the spin and valley degrees of freedom, which are determining uh, the sort of the configuration of the system at those uh, integer filling. Now it's important to keep in mind uh, and to mention that these experiments are done at uh, about six Kelvin or one Kelvin, above one Kelvin, which is where the insulating phases are set in at integer filling in these experiments. So we like to think of these as the, if you like the parent phases, the normal phases from which both the insulating and also the superconducting phases emerge from as you cool the system. So you can see there's a very strong correlation effect in here, which is creating this broadening, but also creates these cascades of features. Now, as I mentioned, uh, there is a, a results from Shahal Ilani's group in Israel, uh, which uh, appeared, they are, both papers appeared together online and in nature. We coordinated with them because we, we found that we were doing, we were finding similar things, but using completely different experimental techniques. Shahal and his group in collaboration with Pablo, uh, they measure the uh, compressibility, inverse compressibility, and they turn that into the chemical potential uh, as a function of filling, which is what you see here. And what you see is that their results look remarkably similar to what we extract in our experiments. In fact, if you exclude any kind of interaction between the injected electron and the electrons that are there, simply reading off the, the change in the remote band and saying that that is related to the chemical potential directly, the numbers even match up. It's about, about 10 millimeters. So this is, this is very nice. 
um, we uh, we tend to not want to focus that uh, these features having to do with uh, any kind of uh, sort of polarized states, if you will. I think they've tried to argue that these are polarized states, and I think that um, you you know very much possible that you get these features even if you do, haven't broken any symmetry because of just the simple physics that I showed you uh, in the problem from just the Coulomb and an interaction from spin and valve. Now, why, they, why there is no jump, like we discussed in the, in the simple model, has to do with the fact that there are Dirac points in the system, and these Dirac points are not fully gapped uh, at these elevated temperatures. And that's, that's probably what's giving rise to this you know, absence of a clear jump, which would indicate a presence of a gap in the system, which is one thing that they have focused on uh, in explanation of the result, but their results are using some band structure model in which they have to assume the interaction is larger than the bandwidth. So it's in a very strongly correlated regime. Okay, now these kind of cascades of features, as I mentioned, of course is related to the insulating phases at low temperature. Uh, you can kind of see that uh, if you look at DIBV uh, at, as a function of uh, gate voltage at zero at, at the chemical potential, it's, uh, it's these features, these, these dips that end up becoming the gaps that you get uh, at the low temperature in the system. Now incidentally, uh, the observation of these asymmetric looking uh, of features in the chemical potential. You see how the chemical potential is coming in to be flat as you approach the, the integer filling and then it rises rapidly and then it's flat again and rises rapidly. It turns out that this can be used to understand uh, the early puzzle in these experiments about the, the nature of the lambda fan diagrams. So I'm, I will, if I have time, I will say also a few things about the Landau fan diagram. But one of the early mysteries in this field was that as you apply a magnetic field and a change of density, uh, where you see quantum oscillations in the magnetic field, which you can translate into these sort of fan diagrams, the quantum oscillations were only seen on one side of the integer filling uh, uh, values. And this is directly related to basically this asymmetry in the slopes uh, of the chemical potential at each cusp. Because the slope of the chemical potential is basically telling you about the density of states. And this density of states is as it's, it, if it's low, this it gives rise to a sharp change in the chemical potential uh, with density. And that makes the lambda fans very visible Whereas if you have high density of state, it makes the lambda fans very difficult to detect. So that's an explanation between these cascades of, of features or uh, changes in the system electronically uh, and these uh, resetting of the Fermi surface uh, at each new that we see in the experiments at lower temperatures. How am I doing on time? Ali, you have talked for 50 minutes, you still have 25. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, so far, uh, I, I wanna show you some control experiments. Uh, uh, so, so far I've shown you only results on the magic angle. So you might wonder, well, if all of this physics, uh, like the broadening that I talked about, the cascade of features that I spoke about, is this, is this, is this there at other angles? So it's very, this is very easy to test in our, in our work because in a typical sample that we make, we often find areas that have the wrong angle. And uh, this becomes a very nice uh, way to check our uh, experiment. We just go over somewhere else. We find a different Moray uh, periodicity. And from this, we can, we can say, oh, uh, this system is at a slightly different angle. Uh, forget this system is, this one is at 1.72 uh, degrees. And uh, what you see here is at 1.72, uh, the peaks are there, the, flat, the flattish bands are there but they're actually not that flat anymore. And, and if you do the same procedure I described at the beginning of the talk, take the SDM topograph and uh, extract some sort of uh, strain, put in the model calculation, produce what the density of states should be on the AA sites from the model calculation compared to the data, you can convince yourself you can understand the single particle picture. And then of course you can repeat the same experiments I told you, measure these two flattish bands, 
high density of state bands uh, as you tune the gate voltage. And you can see them cross onto the chemical potential as you cross the gap between the uh, flat band and the re remote band, and then they cross out. Uh, but here, the blurring, the broadening, the, uh, the type of uh, uh, features, sudden features that I was telling you about, it's just gone. So as we go away from the magic angle, uh, we find that the peaks get broadened because you don't have as much of a flat band. And as the peaks get broadened, they're not as sensitive to the interaction effects which turn on as you sweep them through the chemical potential. Like look at this green curve. It's right going through the chemical potential. It shows no splitting. It shows no changes in its behavior or its, uh, or its partner, a lower uh, flattish band. And this is a, a nice illustration of one of the knobs in the system. As you change the twist angle, you have quite a bit of control over uh, the uh, interactions. So when the magic is gone, you basically- uh, uh, Ali, a uh, quick, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, when you, uh, I see that you're changing you when you're changing the angle, but is it a continuous change or you have a sudden drop when you find Okay. Or a sudden rise when you get to the magic angles. So, so we, we have done maybe, you know, four or five angles. We haven't done a very precise uh, controlled experiment as a function of angle, but we can kind of refer to some theory work, which tries to estimate the value of U uh, versus t over T as a function of the angle. And it's kind of roughly what we, what we you know, it, it, theory will tell you is very sensitive. So this is a calculation, uh, I think, um, from one group. Um, and uh, what you see here, I forget what the two different calculations refer to, but the, the main idea here is that it's very much uh, getting singular, of course, in the limit of a perfectly flat bands. I mean, what's interesting about this particular calculation, I think that the authors of this calculation from London were also part of this other paper, uh, which is by uh, Efetov, in which they vary the distance between the magic angle uh, graphene and the gate nearby. Of course, this tunes uh, the, uh, the screening because of the nearby gate. And what they estimated, and this is actually quite a nice surprise for us, was the value of the interaction U, what they estimate, goes to about 23 milli electron volts as you make devices where the distance between the gate and, the, um, and this magic angle is very large. And all the experiments I showed you today are in this limit. So the answer to your question is that it is, it is kind of semi-singular behavior as you get to the magic angle in theory. There's not enough experiments to say that because as you make a different device or some group makes a different structure, they may be changing both the angle slightly and also the distance to the nearby gate. So more systematic work needs to be done. For example, in our device, the distance is quite large, is 300 nanometers. So it's in agreement with this type of estimate. But it's kind of a novel system because you could vary the twist and people are already exploring varying the distance to the gate as well as the twist. So there's a, there's a lot of interesting knobs uh, that you can vary. So um, I'm pretty much done with what I wanted to mostly tell you, so since like there is 10 more minutes, I, I will wrap this up and show you some very recent experiments for which I have a few slides, which are very rough, uh, but I wanna tell you about them. So what we've done is to de experimentally demonstrate that U is the largest energy scale at the magic angle. And we believe these cascades are kind of like a nice signature of the degeneracy and I think it sets the stage for spin or valley polarized states at integer filling. Uh, and this is something maybe I'll uh, discuss with you in a moment. And this may be insulating, this may be the insulating state at integer filling. And uh, of course, uh, breaking of symmetry with such strong interactions is a natural thing uh, to happen. But what the exact nature of the insulating states are is something, or the superconducting state for that matter, is something that we're still working on. So uh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this. So this is what I did. So I wanna tell you about an experiment that was, we just recently concluded uh, at the magic angle uh, using uh, uh, basically a, 
an instrument which we had been using in these experiments, which can also get down to millikelvins. And our interest was to look at superconducting behavior and so on, which are, we are still working on. And we stumbled upon a very interesting uh, observation of uh, topological phases. So let me just, uh, you can see I'm not fully prepared to talk about this. I'm gonna backtrack for a moment and go to the very beginning of my introduction to show you uh, what was the, the status of uh, sort of topological phases before the experiment we were doing. So this is a beautiful experiment by, done by Andre Young where he, 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 he aligned the magic angle twisted by layer graphene with the boron nitrite. Uh, and he observed that uh, you can basically take the system and when you're at filling equal three, so new equals three, so you, you filled up almost the top flat band, you have uh, you know, a one electron missing per moray site. And uh, so you also think about, uh, you know, you have four degrees of freedoms, right? You have, to, two degree, you have two spin and two valley degree of freedom. And uh, you are breaking the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, sublattice symmetry using the boron nitride. And this led to the discovery of this anomalous quantum Hall effect. So, and the, uh, so the system spontaneously is magnetizing and it's uh, showing a Hall effect with the quantum of, quantum of Hall conductance. So the way you try to understand this is that, so you think about these squiggly lines that we have here as the flat bands. And what they propose is that, uh, so you have uh, flat bands, uh, you know, lower and upper flat bands. You have them around valley K and minus K, or K prime. So this is represented here plus and minus. And each one of them have uh, two spin degrees of freedom. So remember what we are doing is we are removing one electron from the system. So one of these levels is going up, okay? Now what happens is that when you put boron nitride underneath this, what boron nitride does is basically gaps the, uh, the Dirac point. So these two bands, these two flat bands, before you put the boron nitride there, are connected by a Dirac point, okay? So what the boron nitride does is gap the Dirac point and you end up with, with the churn number for these bands, which is written down here. And now what you do is you, 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 you go to deplete one electron. And what uh, Andrea basically proposed was that in this situation, you interactions, as I've been showing you, even in the presence with boron nitride, is, is basically polarizes the system. So it lifts the degeneracy of this, in this valley so it creates a system which is spin and valley polarized. And it, it, this, this is, can be remain polarized even if you remove the magnetic field and give you basically a churn insulating state with a churn number one, okay? So keep that in mind. And now let's uh, go to the kind of experiments we can do. And I apologize, this is a busy slide. You can see I pulled it out of the paper this morning or my student gave it to me late last night, <laughs> which I put in this talk. So now we can do the same experiment I've been telling you about, but go to millikelvins and then apply a magnetic field, okay? So there are three panels here. So one is a field of one Tesla. I apologize for the busyness. You can kind of see this sort of flares of features coming out at different uh, filling factors that I've been speaking about. But now we gotta focus on these gaps, okay? See there's a gap here. And now we turn on the field. And then you see that this is, this is the, our flat band coming through and going across, this is so blurry. You put the field on and you start to see what we call Landau, these are Landau levels, which are developing uh, in the system and they're kind of basically crossing the chemical potential as you tune the, uh, to the carrier concentration. So this is the charge neutrality, okay? And what you see here is a cascade of, again, feature, finer features when you have a magnetic field on, okay? So what you're looking at is a combination of many different things going on in this data. One is the Landau levels crossing, okay? So in this system before, uh, and this is a sample that we know is not aligned with boron nitride. Okay, so if it's not about lime with boron nitride, uh, sort of um, 
uh, the physics should be different, okay? So I can, I'm gonna focus on two things. One is I'm gonna focus on this cascade of gaps near charge neutrality, but also you notice there is a gap here and then there are these other gaps that kind of develop and they seem to be happening at some other values of filling not related to integer filling uh, as you change the magnetic field, okay? So let's focus first on the, uh, uh, what we call the zeroth lambda level, okay? So uh, this system, if you, if you don't have boron nitride, it should have a, a crossing between the, the, the conduction and the valence span, the Dirac point, okay? And this Dirac point should have an eightfold degeneracy, okay? And this eightfold degeneracy uh, should, uh, it, could, it could change as if, you, if you perturb it by say strain, or if you perturb it by interactions, okay? And uh, so this is kind of like the zero level lambda level in graphene. When you apply a field, you have the Dirac point and you get a zero level coming from the Dirac point and you have the first lambda level somewhere far away. In this system, what looks like a zero lambda level, which should be eightfold degenerate, is already split by some single particle physics. Why, why is it single particle? Because it's split if this peak is um, basically below the chemical potential or fully above the chemical potential. And what happens is that as we, uh, as we change the gate voltage, and when we change the gate voltage uh, at this field, we know how that corresponds in terms of the degeneracy in the system. Uh, we know what we are doing is we are basically removing essentially one quarter of the degeneracy, one eighth of the degeneracy as you go from this gate voltage to this one. And we see sequence of basically splitting of these peaks. So the first physics we discovered is, is the zero lambda level in the system, uh, basically a charge neutrality, for example, here is gapped, okay, because of some single particle physics, okay, plus uh, some interaction effect, which is gapping it. And then as you partially fill it, you create this partially filled zero lambda levels because this, this system has a rich degeneracy. You create basically a, a, a sequence of quantum hull ferromagnets. And uh, these are the, this is what's giving rise to this sequence of features or gaps in the system. These are gaps between, uh, you know, it's this gap and then this one and so on. Now going back, that's one feature. We also see these gaps that I told you about, which were kind of confusing where they're coming from. And they look like this. So you, you know, here, here at this particular field, which is, I believe, uh, at uh, uh, six Tesla, as you sweep the density at some density, you know, you, this gap really fully develops and then it goes away. And then you have some small little gaps that's often present, which might just be due to the presence of the magnetic field. But there is some special values of density at a given field where these things happen. So I have some very clever students and this is, uh, this is the beauty of uh, having clever students is that they always come up with things that you never thought of even you've been doing SDM you know, all your life. So my students basically recognize that if you have a gap in spectroscopy and this gap is related, is not, is a, is not a trivial gap. It, it's not like just a simple band insulator, but actually is a, 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 a topological gap. Uh, this, when you change the density, because you, and when you change the magnetic field, you change the degeneracy uh, of, the lab, of the Landau levels. And this change of degeneracy, okay, uh, makes you observe this gap at a di different density. And there is a very famous formula in the quantum Hall literature, which is the strata formula, which tells you that the charge density of a churn insulating phase changes with the magnetic field at a rate that is equal to its quantized Hall conductance. So remember I was telling you about the zero Landau level. So what is plotted here, uh, for the top is one device and the bottom is all the devices we've measured. What you see, what you see as the plotted as the points are the uh, density determined by the gate voltage 
at a given magnetic field where you see a gap. And that gap persists over some range of density in our experiment, and that's represented by the error bar. And what they found, what, what they were looking at, were sort of trying to make a kind of a lambda fan diagram having to do with the lambda levels coming out of the charge neutral point, very much like you do in magnetotransport experiments. But of course, they had these other gaps that were happening in between at, at higher fillings away from charge neutrality. And you can also track those. And what they discovered is that there are basically these gaps that behave like churn gaps because they move with the magnetic field at a finite slope. And if you basically uh, follow their slope and plot your data as a function of filling factor versus flux per unit cell, you basically realize you can directly measure from the STM experiment using this formula, their churn number. So what uh, what's, was discovered by Andrea Young in BN aligned samples uh, was at three quarter filling of the top flat band. He observed when he aligns his sample at churn number one, which I described to you how it comes about. And that's, we also see it if you apply a little bit of field. And uh, if you apply a little bit of field without any, um, without any boron nitrogen alignment, this phase manifests itself. And in addition to that, we see a sequence of two, three, and then on the other side is minus three, minus two, minus one. And we believe these things in the middle are just, these are the different lambda levels uh, having to do with the physics of the band structure of this system, uh, which also allows you to calibrate your churn number because churn numbers between the lambda uh, levels should always change by one. So what's really nice here is we, we've come ac across something that was completely unexpected uh, in the experiment because by applying a little bit of field, we seem to stabilize these churn states, which we believe are just generated by interaction in the system. So uh, we have a, a model of where this might be coming from in terms of interaction to produce the churn numbers that, that we see, which is different from what was proposed uh, with the BN alignment. We believe interactions is really changing the, uh, the property of the system and is breaking time reversal symmetry and creating a Haldane mass, which is actually giving rise to the right churn numbers, uh, which, I'll, which is, takes a bit to explain, but let me just put that out there. It's explained in this paper. And what's remarkable is uh, as we submitting this paper, uh, transport people now have the, also discovered this in their data. Uh, Eva Andre put a paper that appeared on the same day as ours. Uh, uh, these are uh, same kind of transport fan diagram that I've told you about. Again, if you cannot kind of see it in this data that clearly, again, if there is a gap that appears in transport studies, uh, like you see here in Andrea's young data, very clear suppression of the resistance. Uh, this clear suppression of resistance is giving you a gap. And this gap is moving as a function of density and field. Uh, just following exactly the same uh, numbers that I told you about. So what's exciting about these results and ours is that the interactions are basically in creating these churn phases. And this is kind of uh, what we were hoping to find uh, uh, when we were working on topological insulators is examples of topological phases that are driven by interactions. So uh, I'm going to basically conclude uh, by saying that, you know, what's exciting about the system is that in addition to uh, superconductivity and uh, co uh, correlations, correlated insulators, uh, basically, you know, with this slide, you know, this has every, this system has almost everything in it. Uh, we haven't quite figured out the superconductivity yet, but, or the insulating phase, but it's a very rich place to play around. So let me just stop there. I've talked quite a bit. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ali. The usual cue. And uh, do I have any, any questions from, from the audience? You can type your questions in the chat box or raise your hand or just open your mic and I'm just looking here at everybody.
I think your audience is is exhausted from two weeks of summer school. <laughs> three weeks. <laughs> three weeks. Okay. Three weeks. Three weeks of Zoom. Oh, well, I I, I share the. Uh, uh, Ali, I have a question, a uh, technical question on, on STM with with a gate field. Yeah. D does does it give you a problem when you apply a voltage on the back of your substrate for your tunneling cone? I mean, the, 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 or, or I remember that magnetic field end, for instance, RPs is impossible because you just move oh. the electrons away. Oh, right? I see. You're worried about the electric field. Uh, the electric field induced changing. by the gate voltage. Ah, okay. Uh, well, so the the um, no, because I guess there is there is some there are electric field effects, and we are trying to actually use it to our advantages uh, to, to to tune system which are electric field dependent. Um, but for the most part, I would say it changes the density and. Um, but that's what you want the, to do, the right? Tip, the tip itself, that's what we want. The tip itself also changes the density a little bit. So actually we see that the tip also acts as like a little bit of a gate in these systems. Uh, but for the most part, the electric field there doesn't really change the tunneling as much as the, the changes like, you know, tuning through a band would. So you're right that a little bit of electric field. Yeah, okay, so here's the, here's the way to think about it. The tunnel junction is like five angstroms. Okay. You put say one millivolt or so across that. You can calculate the electric field there. It's much, much larger than the effect of the electric field that you okay. put yeah. with, with the tip, with the gate. Yeah. So I think that's the, that's the answer to your question. The guys in the audience. Hi, uh, since you have uh, enough time, maybe you could uh, explain a bit more slowly um, those cascades that you see in the uh, STM um, uh, spectrum, you know, as a function of uh, gate voltage. I think there's uh, so much information and um, I thought it was a bit too fast. So I didn't okay. quite get, even though it looks very interesting. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so I guess maybe I can start uh, with the, just explaining this, this part. So I mean, this is, so the model that we have of what's happening is that, so if you look at this plot in the theory, right, uh, the bright lines basically tells you the probability of things happening being large, right? right. So if you, if you, if you start with your, two you have two flat bands both of the lower one is is almost empty here the the upper one is completely empty right so when you tunnel you can tunnel into the lower one because it's very close to the chemical potential because it's almost empty right that gives rise to this feature does that make sense yes and then this one just corresponds it's only two e naught away and that corresponds to tunneling into the upper level, okay? Right. And basically, because you have no electrons in the systems at all, right? Then uh, you don't have to pay the Coulomb energy U. And uh, you, the, the possibility of tunneling into a system, uh, to, to the, the probability that you have to pay the energy U to tunnel into the lower level is almost zero, which is why this line, the third line is very faint. And the probability that you tunnel into the upper level and pay the energy U is also very unlikely because you have almost no electrons in the system. Right. Okay. But now let's go up here before we cross, or before we cross this threshold of uh, going from minus four to minus three. So when you're very close to having almost one electron everywhere in the system, Okay, you still have, you can still put an electron in the lower level because some places there is no electron, but then some places there is an electron. So you have to pay the energy U to put an electron there. So instead of two peaks, you get four peaks and they're almost, almost as equally bright for, with one another, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just the two levels 
and then you have two levels with plus energy U. Mm -hmm. But now if you have filled that level completely, okay? So you have one electron per site everywhere, okay? Now mm -hmm. you can go back and ask, now what can I do? Well, I can remove an electron that's in the system, that's here. Mm -hmm. okay. I, can, I, can, I can remove an electron from the system that's there. Oh, I gain an energy U if I remove that electron, right. okay? And that's why there is a feature here. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, well, you know, I can, I can put an electron at 2E because that's not at the lower level. Maybe mm -hmm. it will find the site where there is no other electron there, okay? Mm -hmm. It's rare, but it's possible. But then also you have to pay the energy to 2E, two, 2E two plus U, okay? So basically the, the point here is that this cascade of transitions in this picture is simply reflecting that this, uh, you are kind of filling a Hubbard band, if you want to think about it that way. This Hubbard band that you had originally is broken into uh, spin and valley, if you like, uh, flavors. You fill one, and then you can think about the physics of filling the next one. And right. that is, is all dependent on the interaction term U between the different sites. Mm -hmm. Or this is on-site interaction uh, mm -hmm. between, between electrons on the same site. So uh, this are, the picture is extremely simple. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's now clear. So I think it's, it's really great that the uh, position of the uh, energy levels are constant, independent of um, the filling factor. And then what you're seeing is the intensity changing what yes. adds up and, and so on. Right. So, you know, and also you could say, well, this doesn't quite really look like this data, but you can kind of see that the, the, the abrupt changes in this model mm -hmm. is coming at energies of you. And that's what the most important thing we are trying to get. And then you can say, well, wait, why is it so broad? Well, it's broad because it's tunneling and, and mm -hmm. we don't have a model for that. And mm -hmm. then there is also, the bands are not completely flat, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now, um, so this is uh, such a great way of showing uh, what U is. Have you seen it in other systems? Uh, no, we, we, you know, this experiment is like the first of its kind where we are, we are basically doing, uh, we, are, we, we are tuning a system between its interacting and non-interacting counterpart. I mean, this should be possible in a lot of different 2D platforms but it's not something we have ever done or anybody else I know has seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because it would be great if you could do this in bulk materials where people have all these guesses about what you is, but. Yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think it's easy to do uh, this in a, so, so the, the power here is that you, you gate, right? And you, you can't gate a bulk material very easily. Right. right. And that's the, that's the power of it, yeah. It's the beauty of these 2D materials. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Okay, uh, any other question from the public? Okay, great. Well, well, thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Ali. Uh, now it's a, a, an analog clapping, the digital first and now analog. Uh, Mark, do you need to make any announcement or we can just close the session? No, I think we can close the uh, session and then um, we hope that uh, uh, everybody will, will be uh, present tomorrow for the final day of, the, uh, of this unusual Les Uches school. Yeah, I heard there's a cocktail, right? Yes. <laughs> Take care, you guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Ali. Bye.